When you sit on a hot cinder, a second seems like an hour. When you're courting a nice girl, an hour seems like a second. That's relativity, Albert Einstein. Click. A millisecond drops. Click. Then another. Click, click, click. Seconds start to gather. The dial is racing. Our vision shakes as we pull back, revealing interior Janus 2, a spacecraft of mid-century design and it's crashing. Strapped inside the cockpit, Paul Hawkins, 28, straw-haired, handsome, wearing an Apollo age spacesuit. He clutches the armrest for dear life. Exterior space, Janus 2 shoots past the lunar surface, arcing toward Earth. Interior Janus 2 continuous. Paul forces his eyes open. The control panel shakes beyond comprehension. He struggles to extend his finger towards a blinking ignition button. He presses it. The engine sputters out, too late. Janus 2 rips into Earth's atmosphere. Paul takes hold of the controls, forcing the nose up. Nellis, this is Janus 2. Flames whip past the window. The heat shield burns red hot. Nellis, this is Commander Hawkins. Do you copy? No answer. Paul looks at the control panel. A 1960s Polaroid photo is wedged between the switches. Maggie, 25, a beautiful woman with red hair, smiles up at us. Paul takes Maggie's Polaroid and pockets it. The clouds clear. Paul takes a deep breath. He pulls a lever. The cockpit jolts. A parachute ejects from the craft. Its sheet catches the wind and tears, useless. Secondary chutes are ejected. They hold barely. The craft continues to plummet. The Gulf of Mexico does somersaults in the cockpit window. Paul braces. Janus 2 crashes into the waves with an explosive spray. Cut to a champagne bottle is uncorked. Bubbles overflowing. Interior Paul's house, day. Edwards, California, 1969. The living room of a stylish ranch home. Walter Cronkite's voice can be heard over party music. Paul, a year younger and all the more carefree, pours champagne into flutes. He hands them to his guests. Come on, we're gonna miss it. Bruce, take the needle out that thing, will you? Paul's wingman, Bruce, 28, lifts the needle off the turntable. The guests crowd around a small television. Come on, Paul, you gotta set the mood. It's the moon, surely, not American Bandstand. Gather around, get your champagne ready. Norman Hawkins, Paul's identical twin brother, enters. He's the opposite of his brother. Shy, shaggy-haired, sporting denim and a five o'clock shadow. Norman hangs back, swigging his beer. Billy, 25, freckle-faced and giddy, nudges him. Oh, hey, Norm. A few years we'll be watching your brother up there, huh? Norman smiles half-heartedly. Billy squeezes to the front. Norman spots Maggie across the room. It's clear from his expression he knows her. Maggie catches Norman staring. He averts his gaze, turning back to the broadcast. It's starting. We watch the CBS coverage of the moon landing. Neil Armstrong descends the lunar module. Very, very fine grain as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. It's one small step for man. Son of a bitch. One giant leap for mankind. The guests cheer over Cronkite's commentary. Norman slips away. He doesn't notice Maggie watching him. Later that night, Paul's furniture has been pushed aside, making way for a dance floor. Music and cigarette smoke hangs in the air. Maggie wanders the perimeter, sipping a cocktail. Norman passes, accidentally bumping her. She drops her glass. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. No, it's my fault. I'm not good at navigating on the ground. Some things never change. You don't recognize me, do you? Maggie? Yeah. Wow. You grew up? You had me worried for a sec. I thought you'd forgotten about me. Not likely. Norman sees the shattered glass. Uh, here, let uh, me... I got it. No, it's, it's fine. Let me just... Norman slices his right palm. Ah! Oh, my God, you're bleeding. It, it's, it's nothing. Here, come into the kitchen. Maggie leads Norman to the sink. She wets a napkin and begins to clean the cut. I'm surprised to see you. I figured you put this desert in your rear view a long time ago. Who says I didn't? You're still here. Guess I couldn't stay away. Anyway, it's where I'm needed. Paul told me about your father. I'm sorry. Norman nods. Maggie gently wraps a cloth around his hand. There. Thanks. So, what brings you back? 
Palmdale offered me a scholarship. College girl. Shut up. What about you? Hmm. Oh, I uh, specialize in aerial pesticide application. Basically, crop dusting. I like being outdoors. Maggie nods in feigned fascination. A slow song begins in the next room. Both look to each other expectantly. Would you... Do you want to... A drunken Paul enters. He hands a beer to his brother. Looking a little dry over here, Norm. What happened there? I threw a bottle at him. Hmm. Guess you thought you were me. You know, Norman was a test pilot too back in the day. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Pretty cocky one too. Uh, You weren't so humble yourself. (laughs) He'd tell you how he almost broke Mach 7. He didn't. Almost. Keyword. See, Norm was on this milk run, right? Breaking in a new X-15. He passes Mach 6 and boom! It's like he hit a brick wall. Norm's tail spinning. I'm watching from the deck thinking I'm buying a pine box. When this son of a bitch pulls out of it, not a scratch on him. I got lucky. You had talent. So did Mike Adams. Yeah, well, Mike didn't have the bird you did. Exactly. I'm going to get another drink. Maggie crosses to where the punch bowl is set up. Both brothers eye her, then turn awkwardly to their beers. How's mom? Same. She's lonely. She's got you. You know, if you need anything. We're fine. Any word from NASA? Still checking the mailbox. You know, they would have snatched you up, too. You'd have stuck around. Think I'll stick to dust and fruit. (laughs) Old moth still flying straight? It's flying. Norman walks away. Paul smiles. Hippie. Square. Norman exits. Paul admires Maggie from afar. Exterior, California desert layer. The mountains of the Mojave are silhouetted against an Ingo sky. Paul's convertible speeds down the desert highway. Interior convertible, continuous. Paul drives as Maggie sits beside him. 264,000 feet. That's about 50 miles straight up. Break that and you get your astronaut's wings. View's not bad either. I'll take your word for it. I like feeling the earth under my feet. No, it's different in a cockpit. It's... More like falling in a dream. So you never get scared? Every time. But that's what makes it interesting. Exterior Maggie's house later. Paul pulls up in front of a darkened home on a drowsy street. Maggie lingers in the passenger seat. Thanks for the ride. Anytime. We should land on the moon more often. Makes a great party. Paul gazes at Maggie's lips. They both lean in to kiss. Paul lifts his arm off the car horn. (laughs) If my mother wasn't up before... (laughs) Sorry. It's all right. Well, good night. Maggie gets out. Paul watches her saunter up the path. When can I see you again? Maggie turns. She makes a phone with her fingers. Call me when we get to Mars. Paul gives her a thumbs up. He drives off with a smug smile. Interior Hawkins Farm that night. A barn long since worn by time and termites. Norman tugs the door open, lit by the headlights of his 57 Chevy pickup. Light floods inside the barn, revealing a rusted tiger moth biplane. Its yellow wings and dented propellers peek out from underneath a canvas tarp. Norman slides a hand across the fuselage. He tenderly adjusts the tarp over the wings before shutting the door. 